and turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm going to talk to you today about the cross. There's so many things that are being endangered today in Christianity. Uh, Moses' Ten Commandments are under heavy fire. Churchanity of any <coughs> excuse me, churchanity of any shape or form in government or politics is under fire. Our children in school can't even wear a t-shirt with something religious on it anymore. Uh, they've abolishing uh, everything from Christmas trees to the lights if it has anything to do with the babe of Bethlehem. So there is a signal effort everywhere to put down anything they possibly can of Christianity. I look for one of the next put downs. If it is not already underway, they'll put down the cross. Numerous people wear a cross around their neck every day. Or they have some other jewelry that signifies the cross. I wouldn't be surprised if neighborhoods didn't come against churches that put crosses up on them. You see, all of this is a conviction in our world today. Our world is under heavy conviction. I do think time is short, and I think the Lord is coming soon. And I don't think men are going to have the opportunity to accept Christ. If Christ comes, the rapture takes place, and the tribulation period begins, I've always been a believer that the people who rejected Christ during this day of grace won't have the guts to be beheaded for Christ during the tribulation period, which may be the price they have to pay. So the enemy's doing all he can to destroy every symbol of Christianity. But no symbol of Christianity is quite as great as a cross. I've always been amused in South Africa where the Dutch Reformed Church is the state church. And the Dutch Reformed Church, when I first went there and I began to notice churches, I noticed the Dutch Reformed Churches had on their steeple a rooster. A rooster. And finally, I asked somebody, why is a rooster there? And they used to be Dutch Reformed. They said, we don't know. I said, why don't they put a cross there like all the rest of us did? Well, said the rooster means something to them we don't know. But they didn't put a cross up. And the more Dutch Reformed people I met, the more I knew they didn't know much about the cross. I don't know what they know about roosters. I haven't had anybody <laughs> to tell me yet why they put a rooster up there as a symbol instead of a cross. Ah. It has to do with the rooster crowing when Peter denied the Lord, but that's sure short of the gospel there. The cross. The cross is to be the most hated thing ever. It was in the days of Jesus. The cross was the most cruel death anybody could come to and the most despised. But when we look in the scriptures, we find something not more stranger, but something more common than you might have ever thought concerning the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's look at a text like we have in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 12, which simply, simply says, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Who is the people that will be so strong against the cross? It'll be law people. Why? Why would law people be so strong against the cross? Now, who are the law people I'm talking about? I'm talking about those that were in the Judaistic churches in Paul's day. Many of those Jews had been saved. 
Many of them had been there present on the day of Pentecost when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came. So they were not novices at religion. And many of these people had something strong against the cross. What if I was to tell you that not a single follower of Jesus Christ ever spoke on the cross of Jesus Christ in this book? Now he had Peter, James, John, at least. Not a one of them speak on the cross. The only writer in the New Testament that speaks on the cross is the Apostle Paul. Why is it that everybody didn't pick up the cross, especially those that had seen the death of Jesus or knew that he died, whether they saw it or not? Why didn't they pick up the message of the cross? You know why? Because if they believed heavily in the cross and what it stood for, it would demolish the law. And did you know even good people didn't want to give up the law? The Pentecostal people didn't want to give up the law. Peter didn't want to give up the law. And so the cross stood as a force and a power against the law. We'll see that today in this message. The apostles, therefore, missed the very essence of the cross. This text says that they didn't want to give up circumcision. What is circumcision? That's something you do yourself to be pleasing to God. They didn't want to give it up. And they felt that if they gave it up, then they would have to accept the fullness of the cross. <coughs> What is the fullness of the cross? That's simple. It's a finished work. There's nothing you can do. It's taken care of. All you must do is believe. So the finished work of the cross denies any self-effort. And so our text says, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. What does that mean? That means that if they look righteous, if they talk righteous, if they appear righteous in an outer form, that suits us because that's what we demand in our religious work. But you see, this had nothing to do with the cross. The fact is that the cross abolished all self-effort and all human responsibility so that we never glory in our flesh. We can never glory in what we do. We can never glory in our own works, for it is all as filthy rags unto the Lord. Well, now we have Christ dying on the cross. The scene is Golgotha. He pulled the cross as far as he could. The black fellow came along, picked up the cross, and carried it the rest of the way. They put the cross in the hole with him nailed on it, and he hangs there until death. The great scene at Calvary is an entertainment scene. It's like going to a boxing match where you hope they'll knock that fella out, knock his brains out, all such terms are used, or kill him. It's like going to a, an automobile race. I've never figured out why so many people want to go to an automobile race except to see the accident. I was there. I saw the thing catch on fire. I saw several cars jammed up. I saw somebody killed. Is that not so? That's kind of an entertainment. That's the way Calvary was. They all wanted to be entertained. And so they would go to Calvary. I don't know how many people were there, but we do have in the scriptures a group of people mentioned. And so I want to talk to you first about what I see 
at the cross, just from an outer view, just as if I could have been there that day that Jesus died, what do I see at the cross? Well, as a believer, the first thing I see at the cross is the horribleness of my sin and disobedience to God. That's the first thing I see on the cross. I see how horrible my sin was because they could have stabbed him, they could have beheaded him, they could have hung him to get rid of him, but God let him go through total body mutilation. Why? He did no wrong. The reason is my sin. I see the horribleness of sin. I see the awfulness of death. Nobody could die a more horrible death than Jesus. Perfect body a few hours before. Now, from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, one with thorns in the brow, the other with nails in his feet. He's been mutilated. His back has been beaten to a mass of hamburger meat. Comes off the bones. They've spit in his face. They've har horribly dealt with him in every way they could. If he had been a mean man, they'd have never done that. But because he had no sin and was a perfect man, they did all they could to destroy the image of perfectness. When I look at Jesus on the cross, I see the result of sin in his flesh, in his body. Wouldn't it be something that if everybody who wore a little cross, now men or women, in their ear, their nose, or their neck, or wherever, that every time they looked at that cross, they could see the horribleness of their sin. That's what I see first at the cross. The next thing I see at the cross is the loneliness that comes in his death. How lonely he is. I went through the so-called seven words he gives at the cross. They're very lonely words. Why have you forsaken me, God? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Like one man in a wilderness crying out. Like one heart that is so far away. You can hardly hear him. I see his loneliness. I see the hopelessness that was in his message. This is what I see at the cross. Thank God on the resurrection morning we see new life. We see a triumphant entrance into the lives of men by his resurrection. If there were no resurrection, it would be of all men most visible, most uh, horribly hindered and hurt. But at the cross, I see the loneliness and the hopelessness. I see that God let him live alone through a horrible experience to the nth degree of satisfaction. Who was to be satisfied? The Father. Who was to be most blessed by the event on the cross? The Father. Because God could not so love the world except he gives his only begotten son. He's the one to be blessed. He's taken his most priceless possession and let it be nailed on the cross. It'll not be in vain. It'll not be a halfway work. It'll not be partway. So the loneliness and the hopelessness of the whole plan of God hangs on the tree. He's got to let it go, the full limit. He's putting down sin. He's putting down shame. He's putting down the devil. He's putting down all the works of evil. They are all manifested in that body. And that body will suffer the nth degree of what is necessary for God to do what he must do. Think about it. 
You know, the thing I see in that is that we don't control life and death. You can take a life, but generally you don't control life and death. You can shoot somebody or you can commit suicide, but you don't control it. You don't control birth. How many people would love to bear a child and can't? How many people don't want to bear a child do? Who determines that? That has to be a God thing because it isn't in the ability of man to control bringing life into this world. And neither is it in the ability of man to control death. If we violate the rules and take our own life or if some accident happens, that's another matter. But you don't control your death. If I've ever seen that so visibly, it has been in the last four or five years when we've had some of our Christ life people to go meet the Lord. We didn't control it. They didn't control it. God controlled the taking of those people. Death has no power. Paul cried, oh death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? So we don't control that. And when I look at the cross, I see the hopelessness of us ever being in control of anything. If God himself can hang on a tree and not control his circumstances, what am I left with? As he did, I shall. He trusted in the Father to get it done well. So must I. Another thing I see at the cross are a number of onlookers. If you're standing there, you can't help but wonder what kind of crowd is going to gather here. What kind of people are going to be here at this scene? Here, the most blessed man that ever walked on this earth is being killed. <clears throat> what kind of people come out to see that? Who are interested in the death of a Savior? Who are interested in the death of a God? Who will come out and see him? Well, we look around the cross, and of course, the most notable person there is Mary, his mother. Little Mary, his mother. Fourteen-year-old girl is now, uh, what is she? She's uh, 45. <laughs> Still a young woman. The elder son's supposed to take care of the mother in Jewish tradition. It was Christ's responsibility as the elder son. But you know, there wasn't one of his four brothers there. There wasn't a one of at least two sisters there. Nobody showed up. There wasn't a soul at his funeral. This is as near a thing as he'll get to a funeral hanging on a cross. There's only his mother there. John the Beloved had brought the mother and was upgirding and strengthening in her. And Jesus looked down from the cross, told John to take care of her. His responsibility, but he's dying. So John, if you will, take care of her. That's, that's a blessed scene. I see that at the cross. You know, I don't know what happened to Mary. It'd be interesting to know. I can't depend on the Catholics. They got her so so fouled up that you can't depend on anything they say about Mary, but it'd be interesting to know because when I was over in, in uh, the Middle East at uh, Greece there at, at, at Ephesus, uh, they had a little house, little place where Mary lived. John brought her over there. So I don't know what happened to that family. Now, if, if mysteries are going to be looked into and I get to heaven, one of them is going to be the family of Mary and Joseph. What in the world happened to that family? No Joseph after one mention. No Mary after the crucifixion. Uh, his brothers, so were very predominant. And they, they stood against the Apostle Paul. In fact, uh, I'm of the opinion that uh, the elder brother... One just under Jesus had to do with Paul's death. So it's a very strange, mysterious situation of that family. I've always thought, why'd God let that happen? Because that's so common. That's common to all of us. To have a strange family. 
and strange things to happen. You don't know how many people I deal with who haven't spoken to relatives in years. Close relatives, brothers and sisters, or mothers and dads. Strange what happens to family. Well, that happened to Christ's family too. I see that when I look at Mary. Joseph was not anywhere to be found. We don't know what happened to him. But John the Beloved was there. Were there any Christ followers there? Who was there that followed Jesus? Did anybody come to this death scene, which is the only funeral scene we have? Did anybody come? If you were Bartimaeus and you heard Jesus was going to be killed, would you go? No, he can't do it because the government is against Jesus. The Romans are killing him. I won't be identified with him. Where's the little woman with the issue of blood? Where's the little woman whose life he saved, who was taken in adultery? Where's that politician who climbed the sycamore tree, Zacchaeus, to see Jesus? Where are 11 other apostles? Well, when I look around the cross, it's a strange scene. They're not there. None of his followers. Well, where are all the religious people? Ah, I can spot them. They're all around the cross. There's a bunch of priests over there. There are preachers there. They're all against him. They're there to make sure he dies and dies, dies good. They're there. Sightseers. Those are the folks out for the entertainment. They heard there's going to be some death that day, so they got to Golgotha to see it. Last of all, there were soldiers there. They had the job of nailing them to the cross and putting the hole in the putting the cross in the hole. What are all these things I see? They're outer things. You're what you see with these eyes. This is what is in your soulish part. This is what I see at the cross. But I want us to look at something else at the cross. I want you to look at the inner life at the cross what's happening inside of people. What do I see? Rather than just looking at the horribleness of my sin as an outer thing, inwardly something cries out and says, see, that's grace. A total given life for you. That's grace. I can't see that outwardly, but I see that inwardly. That's he that loved us and died for us even while we were yet in our sins. That's an inward thing. Oh, that's something that is bigger and greater than just what I see in the outer. I see me at the cross. If I just looked at the outer things, I'd never know this. But now that I know Paul's message, I can look at the cross and see me. I worried that he would pay such a price for my sin. But now when I look at him, I see me in him. That's a step deeper. He didn't just do it generally, just saying I love the whole wide world full of sin. God had put me and you inside of him with our sin. I was in him. Ah, I saw that. I saw the horribleness of what my sin did to him. But more so, if anybody needed to die, it was me. If anybody needed to be crucified, it was me. I couldn't do it on my own. I couldn't pay the price myself. But if anybody needed to be crucified and killed, it was me. So God put me in him, and when he drew his last breath, my old life drew its last breath. 
and died in him. Was buried in him, finally resurrected in him and ascended in him. Now I see the cross in a different perspective. I'm in him. I see how it was necessary that I be crucified with him, as Paul said. Not that I need to be today. I was on that day. The day he died, I died. The day he was crucified, I was crucified. You understand it? It's not something you've got to do. It's something that's already done. And anybody you bring into this world, they are crucified with Christ. They, in fact, are born dead to God. All they got to do when they believe is simply accept Jesus as their Savior, and the old life is dead. It's done. It's finished at the cross. When I look at the cross in a spiritual way, I see that all of the prophecies, hundreds of them out of the Old Testament, are fulfilled in that one day. When he hangs on the cross, everything said about him is fulfilled because he's spoken of time and time again. I hear Isaiah saying he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace is upon him and by his stripes we are healed. <clears throat> the prophecies were fulfilled the in Christ position is made vivid I might have had a difficult time with the in Christ position had Paul not said we are crucified with him but when he added the death and the cross to my life help me to see it. If I was in him in his death, then it's possible I could be in him in his resurrection, in his body. You see, that's a body hanging on the cross, a mutilated body. But this body that comes back is a body made up of many members, including you and I. And it's a beautiful body. It's a perfect body. It's a righteous body. It's a beautiful, beautiful body. So I see the in Christ position. These are inner things that we see. I want you to always remember that inwardly, you're something different than what you see outwardly. And that's the way God intended that it be. The cross is our salvation. Why is Paul the only one that writes on the cross? Not just because he let the law pass. That's what happened to the kingdom people. They wouldn't accept the cross in its fullness because it did away with the law. But why did the Apostle Paul end up being the one who most wrote on the cross? Six of our most famous scriptures on the cross come from Paul in his epistles. Why? Quite simple. God raised him up with the final gospel. The apostles didn't have the final gospel. The end was to come for them whenever the kingdom was restored. The kingdom wasn't restored, so there was never an end. Don't let somebody come along and tell you the end of the world has taken place. It hasn't taken place yet because the people didn't trust the Messiah who would come at the end of the world. But you know, Paul wrote on the cross because he saw that's the place where we were saved and nobody else saw it. That's where you were saved. You're not going to be saved there. That's where you were saved. And every sinner you talked to was saved at that cross already. All they need to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're already saved. But it won't count at all until they accept Christ as their personal Savior. See the importance of that? It's already been done. The work is done. It's a matter of believing now. So why is the cross so hated? First, it abolished the law of Moses. And I need you as believers to mark a couple of scriptures with me. 
So I want you to, if you will, go first to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we want to read verse 15, and I want you to mark it. Because somebody in the law is going to come to you. And this is a verse for him. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. What has he done? He's mentioned the commandments. He's mentioned the ordinances. There are 640 of those, 10 commandments, for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now what I want you to draw a circle around is that word abolished. Is there a better word for how you get rid of the law? Abolish is a pretty good word. It isn't that I spoke against it or I stomped my foot about it. No, he said he abolished it at the cross, in his flesh, he abolished the law. I don't know whether you've ever had it to happen to you or not, but I've had many believers to come to me and ask me why it is our faith preachers and Pentecostal preachers and healing preachers do not preach on the cross. You know why they don't? It's because the cross abolishes the law. It destroyed the law. What do they want? They want people under a law because that's what assists and helps their ministry along. They'll tell people, for instance, if you don't bring your tithes, you're cursed by God. You ever been in a place like that? They don't want to give that up because they don't have a bit of trust in you. They want that 10%. <clears throat> and after they get it from you, uh, having had heavy law put upon you, they turn around and say, the Lord supplied our need. While the Lord was a million miles from that event. He didn't put them under the law. The preacher did. But that's the way they look at it, you see. You need to mark another scripture. Go with me to Colossians 2 and 14. <clears throat> Colossians 2 and 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. There's those ordinances again. That was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Can you believe God let him do that? Can you believe from that blessed moment when Israel cried out for a law that God led Moses to the mountaintop and wrote with fingers on tablets of stone the Ten Commandments and brought it down to Israel and they were worshiping a calf and from that time on the Ten Commandments were underfoot more than overhead? Never did make a lot of difference, and God fixed it so that if they did live it, it didn't matter because they had to keep the whole law for any of it to matter. You say, well, God gave it, didn't he intend for us to keep it? Let's take a look at the cross. What did he do at the cross? He abolished the law in his flesh. His new body has no law in it. Why? It was abolished at the cross. So when Christ gave the final gospel to Paul, the gospel of grace, it was not a gospel of law. It had a lot of commandments, but they were love commandments. No law to it at all. Do you see the difference there? No law to it at all. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he triumphed over them, nailed them to his cross. Go into the 1 Corinthians 1 and 17. <clears throat> Cry 
Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, this is a very tedious point, and I want you to look at it closely. In the previous verses, Paul has talked about the people he had baptized. And he finally said, after listing off a few people that he had baptized, he said, I don't know if I baptized any more than this. And then he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, talking about water baptism, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. What's in that statement? If the work was done at the cross, if the work was finished at the cross, Paul says, nothing else we do matters, not even water baptism. That's a hard thing, isn't it? Because we've all been our lifetime getting and baptized and getting others baptized. But if I follow Paul, I hear him say that nothing, nothing that we do matters. But anything we do do is of non-effect because of the cross. What a statement. So what did the cross do? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Mark these scriptures. They'll help you in time to come. Go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We want verse 18. Now let's go to verse 17. That's one of my favorite verses. What does it say? Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, walk so as ye have us for an example. In other words, watch those. They're worth watching. What does it say? Be followers of me. Nobody else in the Bible can say that except Jesus. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Why did he say that? Because the cross is the finished work of God. And he said, anybody that follows me need to be watched. Because that's what God wants. But he said, there are those that will not walk after me, who will not do what Jesus told me. See, Jesus told him what the gospel was and told him to give it to the people. And so Paul says, now, there are people who will not listen to what I have to say. And he says, I face this weeping. But he said, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Because it's at the cross you're saved and nowhere else. You're saved at the cross. You didn't get saved in the church house. You didn't get saved at an altar. You didn't get saved on your own. You were saved at the cross. And the people who put up some other means of salvation are enemies of the cross. Well, I want to go back to the cross a moment and tell you how the enemies of the cross have a big problem. This time, go with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. This is a scene at the cross. Matthew 27, beginning to read at verse 37. And they set up over his head this accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. 
Likewise also the chief priest, mocking him with scribes and elders, said he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him now, if he'll have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Out of the people who stood around the cross, there are three different groups who desperately tried to get Jesus to come down off the cross. There's first the sightseers, these people who were entertained by the death of the Savior. The sightseers. They said, ha, huh, he performed miracles. He said he could rebuild the temple in three days. He said this, he said that. If he can do anything, let him come down off that cross now. Come down off the cross. They added to it, we'll believe him. If he comes down off the cross, we'll really believe him because he's nearly dead now. Let's see if he can get off that cross. <clears throat> there were thieves there. Poor old thieves. One on his right hand, one on his left. And one of them got saved. New salvation. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. But you know what the scripture said? The scripture said that even the thieves cast the same in his teeth. What did they cast in his teeth? Come down from the cross. Let's see you do something. You're a miracle worker. Do it. Come down from the cross. But there's a third group there. A third group. Who are they? That's the uh, preachers that were there. That's the priests that were there. Now they were the most desperate of all. There are two or three things that enter the mind about them wanting Jesus to come off the cross. The first is, we think they had figured they had made a colossal mistake. They figured they had made an awful mistake getting him there because they were the ones that had the main hand in getting him there. Pilate would have turned them loose, maybe. But they wouldn't. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. They were the ones who figured they'd made a mistake. Why? He may be more popular in his death than he was in his life. So they said, come down from the cross. Come on down. We see we made a big mistake here. Another reason they believed. He may be the Messiah. Maybe it struck them of the numerous times in the Old Testament which they believed and preached where it had said something like this. Maybe they remembered David's 22nd Psalm that told the very things that was happening at that moment. Maybe they remembered Isaiah 53 that spoke of the very things that were happening at that moment. Maybe it dawned on them, hey, this guy may really be the Son of God. Get off that cross. You've got the power. If you're God Almighty, come down from the cross. Come on down. We'll believe in you. We'll trust you. They tried to get him off the cross. Did you know that? That if it had been left to the political, religious powers of the day, they'd have jerked him off that cross and bound up his wounds and saved his life. And we would have all gone to hell. Come down from the cross. But last of all, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about what God saw in all this. What did he see at Calvary? What did he see from his house up in the heavens? What did he see? He saw with great hurt. 
his most priceless possession killed. He saw with greater hurt that he could not help his son in death. That he turned his face from him. Sometimes writers say he did that because Jesus was full of sin and God will not look on sin. Don't know. Supposition. If Jesus had his most bitter hour, then the Father had his most bitter hour because they are one. They are one. Jesus said, Father, as you and I are one, so I want them to be one with me. So the two of them were one. One hurt, the other hurt. Second thing God saw was the finish of his plan. <clears throat> the finished part of his plan. finished part of his plan. Jesus wrote the end on it. He said it is finished. But God could see now the whole finished part of his plan. You know what I think? I think God's mind went back before he created this earth that had become so evil enough to kill his son. He looked back before the earth was created and he thought now my original thought shall come forth. The original thing I plan can happen now. What is finished is everything man can do to please me. Now then, what I'm going to do is what I knew I had to do in the beginning. I'm going to take my son, that one who died on the cross, and I'm going to place his spirit in the human spirit, and that's going to make a Christian. That's going to make my child, my bona fide birth child. I'm going to birth my son in them. My plan is finished. There'll be no more plan. And when I thought of those words, the plan is finished, the thought came to me that everything in the Old Testament details what's going to happen to Israel in their end. But the end of the born again was never detailed until the cross. Our end doesn't come with Israel's end. Our end doesn't come with tribulation or millennium. Our end came at the cross. It was finished. No more God could do. He would go to no more ends to save humanity. Jesus would never die again. There'd never be another drop of blood shed for humanity. The end was at the cross. His plan was finished. Thus, when he gives Paul this message, it's the final gospel. It's the gospel based on it is finished. Nobody in the kingdom message can say that because the kingdom message isn't finished until Israel is restored to the land. And you see how far she's got to go to do that. Our president now is going to get busy trying to straighten out Palestine and Israel. But the end won't come with Israel till she accepts her Messiah. So you see, dear friends, the end for us is at Calvary. Our salvation is fixed. Grace is fixed. Eternal life is fixed. For God so loved the world that he killed his only begotten son that whosoever believes in that son shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's finished. No more he'll do. You can't become greater Christian by a birthing than you are at the cross. You can't get any more God than is given to you at the cross. You can manifest it more. You can learn more. You can be more unctionized and anointed. But you can't get any more from God than is given to you at the cross. It's there. It's finished. And that brings me to my last word. And John 3.16 says, Whosoever believeth shall not perish. Let's separate that line. Shall not perish. 
as a closing word. What did the cross do? The cross made it possible for everyone that did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to perish, to go to hell. Why? Because God never said to Jesus, I love you enough, I'm going to take away this pain and this hurt. God never said to Jesus, I think you've suffered enough, let's quit. Let's shed no more blood, let's get off this cross. No, sir. He died the total death. It was a finished work. Now a person can be totally saved by simply believing that Christ is their Savior. But now also, anyone who does not believe is just as totally sent to hell as if they believed. Because the cross makes the difference. If the sinner can see his sin dealt with by Christ at the cross and reject it, the awfulness of the cross can show him the awfulness of his rejection. And when God saw his son go through the hell of the cross, he knew it would not be hard for him to send people who rejected that to hell. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God knew it. God fixed it. I love the message of the cross. It's really deep. The in Christ message is founded on the cross because the in Christ message starts in Gethsemane. Goes all the way through the cross and through the resurrection. I love the cross. I love that old rugged cross for its suffering and shame because I love what happened there. It happened for me, and it happened to me. Isn't that good? Well, I've said enough. You're a precious group. God love every one of you. Have a happy Easter week. See through Easter. Even bunnies laying eggs. See through it to God multiplying his plan. Jesus Christ.